within me, Lord, we bless you today. Bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never
Here we go. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise
Thank you, team. That song was new to me at 9.30, and I'm grateful to God for it. Amen. Let it ring. Praise the King. Surely fits this Thanksgiving week. Take your Bible. Let's go to Isaiah. We are in the 12th chapter today, and uh, starting a couple of weeks ago, all the way through the end uh, of the year to uh, Christmas Eve and then Christmas morning. Uh, the pastor will be in the book of Isaiah. Uh, that book, that Old Testament book, has more gospel than any other Old Testament uh, book, prophecy that you will find. And we're going to be looking at selected passages, especially chapter 53, when we uh, get toward the end of, end of December, down toward Christmas, uh, as we uh, search out the prophecy of Isaiah. Kyle Yates is an Old Testament scholar. And in his book about Isaiah, Yates said this about the days of Isaiah. He said, Isaiah was a preacher in a day of titanic political struggle and transition. Sounds like our nation. He went on to say that the day of Isaiah was a day of luxury, idleness, and indifference to the needs of others that marked the day along with drunkenness that yielded sorrow and distress. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. And then he said the religious climate of the day there was very little religious depth. Everything surface-oriented. It was mostly show with little substance. Most moral fiber had melted away, and the ethical standards of the people were very low. We live in a day of political transition and change and tension, a day of drunkenness, a day of indifference to the needs of others, a day of luxury for most, and a day when the church seems to wane and the millennial generation, we are told, is walking out rather than walking in the middle of all of that, Isaiah brought a strong, straight, prophetic, pointed word. And in the middle of that word, he dropped chapter 12. Now you know as well as I know, if you've heard me preach very long, that the word of God is inspired from A to Z, beginning to end. But the chapter headings are not inspired. Isaiah didn't write chapter 11 and say, okay, here's chapter 12. Those that organized the scriptures for us in a book put those chapter headings and those verse headings so that it would be more easy to find. Some people say they did it for two reasons. It would make the text easier to dissect and find. And secondly, it would keep preachers from preaching so long. <laughs> break it up some, say you can only go this far today. Well, in the middle of all of that, chapter 12, like a fresh flower blooming in a place where there's little rain, chapter 12 is found. It is a hymn. It is a song that Isaiah writes. He pens. He composes. And it is a hymn of thanksgiving in the middle of a pointed, prophetic, powerful word. And so this week before Thanksgiving, I thought it very appropriate we pause at chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you right now to rise with me. And as you stand, open your copy of the Word of God. If you have a New American Standard that I'm reading from, you can use the text you have. Or there's one in front of you there in the pew rack, that black Bible. Or you can turn your eyes to the screen and you will find the text there. And I would like you to out loud all together in unison with one voice, follow me out loud and read these six verses of this grand old hymn that Isaiah puts in the midst of a hard day. It's the reason we have Thanksgiving. In the middle of everything else, we're to pause 
and be grateful. Read with me. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. He says on that day, on that day, on that day, what day? He's talking about that grand day of the millennial reign of Christ. You will remember and you will be a grateful people. But before we get there, we need to be grateful here. It's the reason our forefathers put Thanksgiving on the calendar. It is to stop busy Americans. To pause and turn their eyes to God. And say thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes to us. I want us this morning to think on this hymn. And I want to show you what I call three stanzas of gratitude. And be a grateful people. Father, anoint me now in these moments. For the man lost in this room saving. Lord, thank you for saving Joseph in the early service. Thank you, Lord, that young adult man came weeping, broken to be saved today. Lord, if someone like him's here, do it again. Lord, for a family that needs a new church coming here to us, I pray, God, you'd unite them with us. And I pray you would turn all of our hearts toward heaven with thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you be seated. This hymn is a bright light in a dark cultural day. It is a song where Isaiah says, draw water from the wells of salvation, that there would be great joy in the midst of an arid, difficult time and circumstance in our culture. A lot of argumentation, fear, jostling back and forth, liars on the right, liars on the left. We find liars everywhere. We find people angry on the right, angry on the left, anger everywhere. In the middle of that, we should pause as God's people, lift our eyes and say, Father, thank you. Thank you for what? Stanza number one, my God is the God of first my salvation. That's what I'm grateful for. Look at it right there in verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and do not be afraid. I challenge you to do a Bible study on the word fear not. You will find it from beginning to end. That's what marks God's people. We do not fear. Fear not. Don't fear what he says, she says, they say, they do. Fear not. We trust God above all. We believe God's in charge. Man is is not. He is our great Savior. My God is the God of my salvation. Now, this word salvation here has two applications to it because the word salvation in the Old Testament is sometimes better translated deliverance. God gives us a temporal deliverance and he gives us an eternal deliverance, a temporal salvation, if you will, on this horizontal plane. And then he gives us an eternal salvation on the vertical plane. 
you this Thanksgiving should be a grateful people, a grateful person for God being your deliverer, your salvation on a day-to-day basis. You remember the day God delivered you from this problem, this difficulty, that heartache? One of the great illustrations of that is found in the 38th chapter of Isaiah. When you read the very first verse of Isaiah, you find that their kings are mentioned there. Uzziah, Ahaz, wicked Ahaz, and then the reformer Hezekiah. As Hezekiah comes, he falls ill in chapter 38. And Isaiah goes to Hezekiah the king and says, Dear king, you shall surely die. The Bible says that Hezekiah fell on his face and cried out, Oh God, be merciful. In chapter 38, you find God speaking and saying to Hezekiah, I have heard your prayer and I am extending your days 15 years. I will give you 15 years. You should die now, but because I'm going to deliver, you're still going to die. but I'm giving an extension. It was a temporal deliverance. Let me tell you, friends, you can go back and look at days where God intervened and he said, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve here. And out of that, you should praise his holy name. The God of my salvation, of my salvific effort, on this horizontal plan, but quickly turn because salvation to us has an even greater meaning on the vertical, and that is it is our eternal salvation. We know that God is our Savior. In Isaiah 63, and verse number 1, you'll see this verse come up on the screen. I want you to see it. Isaiah 63, 1. Isaiah said these words. Who is this who comes from Edom? He's asking a question. Now, who is this who comes with garments glowing colors from Bozrah, this one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. Who is this one? Bozrah is that place. It's like the king is coming. The word Bozrah is a play on words. The word Bozrah is not only a place, it also is the word red or crimson or scarlet. And he said, who comes in these flowing garments, these colors? He says, it is I who speak in righteousness. Look at those last three words. What are they? Say them with me mighty to save. Say them again, mighty to save. He here is prophetically speaking to the end of the book of Revelation when we see Jesus coming with his robes dipped in the blood of the Lamb. Coming from Bozrah, he is red with the blood. And here, who is this one who comes mighty to save? It is Jesus the Christ. He is the God of my salvation. He's mighty to save. He doesn't just say, friend, let me tell you, he's mighty to save. He has the might to save the Muslim. He's doing it all across the world today in missionary work. Thousands, I'm telling you daily, are coming out of Islam and falling at the feet of Christ. You don't hear this news until you read the religious journals and hear the stories of those that are preaching the gospel around the world. God can save anybody. Why? Because he's mighty to save. Not only does he save the Muslim, he saves the intellectual. There are many today, then you hear about these who say, well, God is not, and, and they go off to places of higher education and learning. I'm amazed at intellectual people. Ye- yesterday, uh, I saw it on the news today, uh, on that day of the year, it is the two oldest schools who ever played football always play on that uh, Saturday before Thanksgiving. Yale plays Harvard. They did yesterday. Yale in the Yale yard uh, at Yale. It was amazing to me. The intellect, I mean the brightest of the brightest. Maybe you saw it on the news where students took off all their clothes. I am talking stark naked at the football game lined across with no clothes on. Their parents paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to go to an Ivy League school. These are the brightest of the bright. These are people who will sit in the halls of Congress. They will make laws. 
they will show sway over economics in years to come. And here they stood like a fool, naked, intellectuals. You know what those intellectuals need? Number one, they need to put their clothes on. Number two, they need to know Jesus is mighty to save. Say, preacher, i never seen a day like it. Well, go back to me in my high school days. You remember the streakers? Huh? I remember those crazy people taking their clothes off and run through a mall. Or... Ray Stevens made a million dollars. Look at that, look at that. The streaker. These people with brains. Let me tell you, Jesus can save anybody. Even the person who looks into the face of God and says, you are not. It's what he did for Lee Strobel, that wonderful, wonderful Chicago Tribune writer who said, I don't believe in God, and I'm going to prove he's not. And when he did his study, he ran headlong into the living Christ. God is mighty to save. It's what he did for Josh McDowell when Josh McDowell said as a young attorney, I will prove there is no God of resurrection. And he ran straight into the living Christ. Dear friend, you can try to disprove him all you want, but you're going to a grave to stay. He went into a grave and got out, and he's alive today. He's mighty to save to the Muslim, to the intellectual, to the demoniac. To that one in drugs and alcohol and wickedness and, and, and walking in their way, I'm telling you, he will reach and save to the uttermost no matter how mean and wicked you are. He is mighty to save and can reach and raise and redeem any man, any woman, any person. He reaches the Muslim. He reaches any religious person. He, he reaches the intellectual no matter how much brain power. He reaches to the demoniac no matter how deep we are. But let me tell you today, friend, not only is he mighty to save those, he's mighty to save you. Do, can you take me to a place and tell me of a time when you trusted Jesus? I gave invitation in early service today. <laughs> I stood right here. We didn't have much movement at 930. Two or three people coming. I looked up about halfway back here come a young man weeping. I took his hand. His mother was behind him. I know her. I've known her for a long time. Didn't know that was her boy. I looked at him. I had to kind of lift his head up out of his tears. I said, why have you come? He said, I need Jesus really bad. I said, well, son, I'm here to tell you Jesus is really good. And he loves you really bad. I gave him to an encourager. They went around out of the room. Joseph, I'll get a report later exactly what went on. But I saw him out here in the hall after church. I kind of made a loop around. I had a minute. Thank you, Terry, for being here. You don't sing near as long as that other guy we got. And I, I, I got out a little early and walked around. I saw Joe. I took old Joe. I said, how you doing, Joseph? He had a big smile on his face. It, it's like the burden had been lifted at Calvary. Why is that? Because he's mighty to save. I'm telling you, that's why. You ought to thank him this Thanksgiving. If you're a saved man, saved woman, you ought to say he's mighty, mighty, mighty to save. He is the God of my salvation. Glory, glory to his blessed name. Secondly, not only the first stanza says he's the God of my salvation, the second stanza says he is the God of my strength. He's the God of my strength. Notice it in the latter part of verse 2. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Hallelujah for the strength that he gives us. You remember that day when you didn't know if you could make it, and you were pulling the wagon. It was heavier than you could pull. I know people take that verse over in Corinthians from time to time, and they'll come to me and say, you know, Pastor, God says he'll not put more on you than you can bear. Well, now, you've got to go back and study that text real hard. Don't come tell me that, because I'm here to tell you God does put more on you than you can bear. You say, well, it doesn't say. When you go to the context of that verse, he will tell you he will not put more on you than he can bear. It is Christ in you who is the strength. Friend, I'm telling you, i got more on me, and I can stand right now. If you're living by faith, you've got more on you than you can stand. But you don't have more than God can stand. You don't have more than God can come under because he's the strength. You're not the strength. You're weak. 
You're pitiful. You're broken. But I'm telling you, he is my strength. Never, never is it stronger than he can bear. I want you to listen to these verses. This is going to give you some real quickly. Psalm 46. Verse number one, every time you see the word strength, you say it out loud in this text when I read it. God is our refuge and a very present help in trouble. I, uh, Psalm 62, verse number seven, on God my salvation and my glory rest, the rock of my and my refuge is in God. Psalm 105, in verse number four, seek the Lord and his seek his face continually. Psalm 118, verse 14, the Lord is my and my song, and he has become my salvation. Psalm 138 and verse number three. On that day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with in my soul. I'm telling you, God gives us strength. When you can't, he can. And you often can't, but he always can. And then that great text out of Isaiah 40. We all know verse 31, but we need to get to context. Remember now, a text without a context, a pretext. You got to get to context. We can't wait always here to get down to the last verse, but look in verse 28. Look at this. Do you not know? He's asking you a question. Have you not heard? Don't you know this? Have you not heard this? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not become weird. Do you know God never gets tired? <laughs> His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. When you get tired, he doesn't ever get tired. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Verse 30, though youths grow weary and tired, even when young people get tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain what kind of strength? New strength. They'll mount up like wings with eagles. They'll run, not get tired. They'll walk, not become Weary, look at that verse. Those who wait on the Lord, you got to wait on Him. When you do, you'll gain. You don't just gain strength, you get new strength. God's strength, the strength you had for yesterday is not sufficient for today, but the God who is sufficient for yesterday will give you new strength for whatever it is you got to do today. He gives strength. You ought to thank Him, you ought to give Him praise. Because he's the God of your salvation. He is the God of all new strength. You don't even know what you're going to face tomorrow. But I'm telling you, if you'll wait on God, he'll give you strength for the journey. I know some things I'm going to do this week. At least I've got them planned if they don't change. Some things I don't have a clue about. If I'll wait on God, he'll give me strength for the journey. Thank him. You come to your table on Thursday, pause, give thanks. Turn off the television, take a bucket, make everybody put their cell phone in it. Take that bucket in the other room, no media, nothing, and go around the room and give thanks. I'm, I'm making preparation at our house. I'm taking these little cards home today because our family meets on Sunday I'm giving a homework assignment for Thursday. Everybody takes one of these cards and everybody draws a picture and brings it back on Thursday. And you draw a picture of what you're grateful for. And you're going to explain that little card right after we eat. And always have your Thanksgiving after the meal. Have your time after the meal. Because if you don't, whoever's cooking it's running around. They won't be with you. And, and nobody hates cold gravy more than I do, all right? So have your time, get the pie and all that. Then get all the TV off and the social media. Go around your table. And friend, if you're saved, you ought to tell of the time when you got saved. You got something God's blessed this week, you ought to tell of that. Just... Just engineer a way of doing that in a fun way. Say, Pastor, we've got lost people going to be at our house. Whoa, even the better. Don't cram it down their throat, but just give praise. I'm grateful for this. They don't have to be, but friend, you're going to be glad you told your story when you walk by and look in their casket one day. You're going to have wished you'd have told what Jesus has done for you. Just give him praise. Say, I can't do it. Oh, yeah, you can. He'll give you strength for the journey. 
He, he is the God of my salvation. He, he is the God of strength. But, but there's a third stanza to this little song that's in chapter 12. Not only is he the God of my salvation, the God of my strength, he is the God, God is my supply. He's my supply. So what do you mean? I'm talking about he'll give you what you need. Now, now look at it in, down in verse number four. And in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them remember that his name is exalted. Verse number five, praise the Lord in song for he has done what kind of things? Excellent. He has done, say that word, excellent things. God has done excellent things. He supplies the excellence. You're not excellent. He is excellent. Your name's not excellent to be exalted. His name is to be exalted. He is the supply and whatever it is that we really need, not that we want all the time, but that that we need, God gives it and he supplies. So I began to study this all week long and I went and chased this word excellence, a little old bitty word in the Hebrew, R-O-B. Uh, you don't pronounce it Rob, but it's a little different than that, but it's a small word, but it's a, a big word in English. And we get, and I began to run a, a study on excellence. I went and looked at knaves and I looked at my exhaustive concordance. I, I, I went and got my key word study Bible and I, I began, and, and I found God does some excellence. Number one, he, he gives excellent counsel according to Proverbs 22, 20. Look at this. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge? Dear friend, if you want to know what God says, if you're looking for the way of God, some of you are looking, should I take that job? Should I join Olive Baptist Church? Should, should I marry this girl? Should, uh, should I walk off from that? Should I do this? What, what should I... Find the counsel of God. I'm telling you, friend, he writes excellent things to you. Not mediocre, not kind of good. I'm telling you, God gives excellent counsel. I don't always give excellent counsel. I do sometimes. But it's only when I'm mirroring what the Word of God says. God gives great, excellent counsel and knowledge. Secondly, in Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. Hallelujah. Gentlemen that are married, if you have an excellent wife, this Thanksgiving you ought to give praise. An excellent wife. <laughs> they said, well, are there any other kind? Yeah. <laughs> but an excellent wife, thank God, she puts up with you when you are unputable. Amen. So is that really a word? It is now. <laughs> Amen. She faithful. She wash your nasty clothes. Drive those kids to school. Work a job. Help you. Care for you when you're sick. Friends, you got an excellent wife. You are a rich man. If you're single and you're looking for a wife, that's the kind you ought to be hunting. Her, her worth is far above jewels. Amen. We have an old story at our house where I was a kid growing up. Every family has old stories. Some of them just won't die. They bring it up every time. This is one of my mother's old favorites. She never gets sick. My mother's 85, rarely ill. Never been in the hospital that I can know of. Just a, but one winter, she got the flu. Dad and I were watching a football game. Mother was in the back bedroom, in the bathroom, because I could hear her throwing up. And when it got to the halftime of the football game, I went in. I remember peeking around the door. I said, Mother, if you're that sick, why don't you get up and go to the doctor? Well, that's the dumbest thing ever I said. I was just a young, arrogant, stupid kid. I, and she turned from that ceramic bowl and looked at me and didn't say a word, but her eyes said, if I could get my hands around your neck, I'd stick you down in this sewer pipe right here. <laughs> Y'all remember that day, amen? You know, mama can do it without saying a word. 
Uh, she still tells that story now 50 years later. You remember when you were sick and mama brought and wiped your brow, held your face, brought your chicken soup to you? Amen? Let me tell you, excellence is not always in giant things. He is our supply. And he makes these ladies and puts them in our life. Now, I'm a Bible preacher. And I have scoured the scriptures. And nowhere in this book can I find an excellent husband. I'm not saying they're not good men and godly men, faith, but we don't get that word. An excellent wife. Boy, if you hadn't said thank you, you shouldn't wait till Thursday. Thank you, Lord. Last year on our anniversary, you were so gracious to us and sent us on that two-week trip to Europe, and we sure enjoyed it. But one thing you gave us as a gift is you gave my wife a three-day stay at the Point Clear Marriott Spa, and she went this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and I said, well, would you mind if I tag along? She said, that'd be fine, come on. And so we went over, and we just spent three days. All we did. We just watched the sun come up, watched the sun go down, read our Bible, chatted, took a little walk, and three times a day I drug myself to the restaurant. We just ate and talked and fellowship. Number one, I don't do enough of that with my bride. An excellent wife. I got one. And if you've got one, you ought to thank God for his supply. He gives us an excellent counsel. He gives us excellent wives. But there's one other place I found, in the, and that's in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. He gives us a more excellent way. You, you know he's, he's talked about spiritual gifts all through 1 Corinthians 12. Tongues and healings and discernment and knowledge and all of those things. And then he says, but earnestly, earnestly now, seek the greater gifts and I show you still a more excellent way. And then he writes the 13th chapter, which is all about love. It's just love from beginning to end. And the more excellent way is the God way, the love way. It's more excellent than the gifted way. We have a whole program here uh, called the more, most excellent way. A and you walk in Christ. It is the love of Jesus. He gives a name that's above every name because it's an excellent name. And you walk in that way. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6 that says Jesus has been given an excellent ministry. And that's the way that he walks in it. Dear friend, you should be walking in the excellent way. It's a more excellent way. It's the way of love. There's some people who may come to your house on Thursday. You may go to theirs. There's a rift. The most excellent way is when you walk in love. A few weeks ago, I had a pastoral call come to me wanting me to make a visit in a crisis. It's a non-church member. We had had, weren't mad at each other, but there had just been a, a divide. It was awkward at best, and I tried to send somebody, and I didn't want to go. And I, but I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost wouldn't get off of me. He said, you got to go do that. So I arranged the time, and I walked into a hard situation. All of that just kind of melted away. He just said, go be Jesus. Just go, just go love. And I did. And we put our arms around each other. And we, we wept together. And we prayed. And we asked for... I'm telling you, it's, ama it, it's, it's amazing how excellent Jesus' love is. I mean, you love like Jesus loved? Get yourself out of the way. It's an excellent path huh. to walk in. That's the path you ought to be walking. 
tomorrow I'll do a funeral. Met with a family yesterday. I knew Dallas, visited with him, but in his 90s now he died. And we talked about a lot of things with the family. And then, of course, I wanted to know about salvation. His wife immediately said, Pastor, I know the story. I can tell you. He said, Dallas and I got married. He was not a believer. We started going. She called the name of the church. It's defunct now. It used to be here in Pensacola, not no longer in business. So we were going to that church and said the pastor came by to visit us. Knocked on the door and he sat down. He began to talk to my husband about the gospel. He said there was a stirring and over here our eldest son came walking in the door. He's a little boy. He said he couldn't have been two, three years old. He said he had on his daddy's shoes. You know how kids do. They like to put their little feet in their big shoes. And, and, and he said, she said he, he had those little feet and, and he just came scuffling across there, grinning at the preacher, you know. And she called the pastor's name and said, the pastor looked at my husband and said, that boy is following everything you do. Is he going to follow you to heaven or follow you to hell? She said immediately, my husband said, I want Jesus, and fell on his knees, gave his heart and life to Christ, and was saved. And the tool that God used to kick him across the line was a little boy in his daddy's shoes. I want to ask you a question today. People that are following you, are they following you? in an excellent way or are you walking in a selfish way are they following you to heaven or are they following you to hell are they following you to your selfishness or are they following you to the Savior's likeness his supply is an excellent way of Jesus kind of love I don't know what's wrong with me. It seems like everybody just enjoys Christmas, but not me. It it's, it's just seems like it's fun for everyone else around me. But I hate it. This whole Christmas season. And I'll tell you the reason. I get invited to parties I don't want to go to. I have to buy a Gifts for people I don't even know and some that I don't even like. I hear all of these songs and then I see it again, green and red and red and green. I just sometimes want to puke when I think about those colors. Maybe I'm just old. My body hurts all over. I've got bunions on my feet and my arches hurt. My knees are sore. And sometimes I, I think it might be my heart. Maybe my heart is just three sizes too small. Do you have any advice for me? Get in the Christmas spirit, Sunday, December 11th at 3 and 6 p.m. when you experience the story of Christmas.